Welcome to Value-Based Care, Volume to Value. This is Lecture A, Introduction to Volume to Value. This lecture focuses on healthcare value. It reviews the fee-for-service payment model and provides insight for moving to paying for value, not volume. Also covered are the impact of meaningful use on these programs and the importance of health information technology, or health IT, as a foundation for the shift from volume to value. The objectives for this lecture are to list the major payers of healthcare in the U.S., define the broad strategies of volume to value and shared risk, and describe alternative payment models. To achieve the goals of value-based care, new payment models are used to restructure how care delivery is organized, measured, and reimbursed. This lecture focuses on healthcare value and how to transition away from an emphasis on volume in the fee-for-service model to an emphasis on value. The importance of health IT as the foundation for the shift from volume to value is also reviewed. Value can be difficult to define. For example, someone might go to a beautiful restaurant with great service, but average food, and think that's high value, while others might love to go to an average-looking restaurant where the waitress barely gets to your table, but the food is great, and consider that high value. These examples serve to illustrate that the whole idea of value is subjective. However, value can be measured when standards are defined. To define value in the context of healthcare, first ask the question, value relative to what? Michael Porter defined value in healthcare as healthcare outcomes per dollar spent. The outcomes per dollar spent serve as the measurement standard for value. Measurement is possible because outcomes equate to the population having lower mortality and morbidity rates, which basically means that people should live long, healthy lives. Value in healthcare is of particular concern in the U.S. When compared to other countries, the U.S. pays too much and gets too little. The chart on this slide clearly makes that case. According to this table developed by the Commonwealth Fund based on 2013 international health care data, the U.S. has an overall rank of 11th, but per capita health expenditures that are much higher than the other countries included in the rankings. Of the 10 other countries listed, Norway has the highest per capita expenditure on health care, but per capita expenditures in the U.S. are fully 50 percent higher than Norway's. In comparison with these other developed Western countries, it does seem that the U.S. is spending too much for outcomes that are overall not as positive. Pretty much everybody agrees that it would be bad value to not only pay a lot more than someone else for the same thing, but to end up with something of lesser quality for that money. Imagine someone pays for a Lamborghini, the most expensive car in the world, but gets a Chevy Cruze. The person would be pretty unhappy. The Chevy Cruze is a reasonably good vehicle, but if someone pays the most and gets something that is nowhere near the highest quality, nor what was expected, that's bad value. The discrepancy between what is paid and what is delivered has resulted in a national push to improve the value of healthcare in the U.S. When further exploring the issue of healthcare value, another question to ask is who's paying for this? To change what is paid, we first need to understand who is paying. This pie chart shows the sources of healthcare spending in the U.S. Note that the total amount is $3 trillion. The chart on the left shows that health insurance and out-of-pocket expenses add up to 84% of the total. Of the remaining 16%, half consists of other third-party payers and programs. The chart on the right provides insight into the largest source of health care dollars, which is health insurance. In this chart, the payers include private insurance and the U.S. government. For private insurance, some of the biggest health insurers are United Healthcare, Cigna, and Aetna. Interestingly, the largest sector that pays for health care is the government, mostly at the federal level. Of that slice, the largest single organization that pays for health care is Medicare. The other key program is Medicaid. Finally, the Veterans Administration also pays for a lot of health care. This pie chart presents an analysis of who pays for health care in the U.S. Of the big payers, the federal government funds Medicaid and Medicare. Households where one or more insured persons work for private companies pay 28% of the money that goes into the health care in the U.S. That 28% includes health insurance premiums and co-pays. 
Private business pays a lot of money for health care. If a person is employed, his health care costs are usually lower than those who are not employed and are buying insurance themselves because employers pay a substantial percentage of the cost. 20% of the money that goes to paying insurance comes from private and public employers. Many other entities contribute to the remaining 7%. These include endowments, special programs, and organizations that serve special populations of people. Thus far, we've looked at who pays for health care services. Now let's talk about the payment model that is commonly used in the U.S. to guide how we pay health care providers. The traditional model for paying health care costs in the U.S. is called fee-for-service. In the fee-for-service model, physicians and other health care providers receive a fee for each service they provide, such as an office visit, test, or procedure. The patient or insurance provider may pay the physician, the physician's company, or the hospital after the service is provided. This is in contrast to payments received for the number of patients seen, the number of hours worked, or the number of patients enrolled in a health care panel. From the 1980s, when standardized fee schedules were established, until 2011, the great majority of medical payments were paid for with a fee-for-service plan. In 2011, the Affordable Care Act introduced changes that affect most health care payers and initiated a shift away from the fee-for-service model. In the context of health care value, the fee-for-service model has some very good benefits. Fee-for-service creates an environment that encourages health care providers to work hard. When someone is paid for what she does, she has an incentive to work hard for her patients. And when we're sick, we want physicians to work hard to make us healthier. Also, in the fee-for-service model, there's no incentive to withhold health care from people. In contrast, other models of payment might incentivize a physician to withhold health care if those models aren't carefully designed. This was one of the arguments against health maintenance organizations, or HMOs, in the 1990s, which will be covered more in Unit 7. What are the drawbacks of the fee-for-service model? First, it can result in unnecessary tests, procedures, or visits because the provider is paid based on activity. No matter what the provider does, he is still paid. He may even reorder a redundant test, and there's no penalty for doing so under the fee-for-service model. Second, and more significant from the perspective of value, the payment in the fee-for-service model isn't linked with health outcomes. When someone sees a physician, undergoes a series of procedures, and her health doesn't improve, the physician is still paid. The problem of a physician being paid regardless of whether the patient improves is nothing new. 350 years ago, the French playwright Molière wrote The Doctor in Spite of Himself, a French farce in which a person who is not a doctor is mistaken for a doctor and then cannot escape being mistaken for a doctor. This pretend doctor makes the following comment, which is pertinent to our discussion. I find medicine the best of trades for, whether we are right or wrong, we are paid equally well, we are never responsible for the bad work, and we cut away as we please in the stuff we work on. A shoemaker in making shoes can't spoil a scrap of leather without having to pay for it. We can spoil a man without paying one farthing for the damage done. The concern about payment models in healthcare is not new. What the U.S. is attempting to do is increase value by employing a different model where payment and outcomes are more closely linked. One of the key events in the drive to shift away from fee-for-service was an article in the New Yorker magazine that shined a spotlight on the problems with this model. The article was written by Atul Gawande, a surgeon and author. In his piece for The New Yorker called The Cost Conundrum, Gawande examined data from 2006 for all the costs of Medicare by zip code, and he found that McAllen, Texas had the second highest per capita cost for Medicare spending by city in the U.S. When Gawande examined the data for McAllen, he found that the Medicare patients there weren't any sicker than patients in similar cities with much lower costs, yet they received more tests and more procedures than those in similar cities. In spite of this, the quality of care based on quality measures and patient outcomes actually turned out to be below average. In the article, Gowande reached a conclusion that many agree with. The primary cause of McAllen's extreme costs was, very simply, the across-the-board overuse of medicine. In other words, unnecessary tests, procedures, and so on. This article underscored the need to look at a different way of paying for Medicare. 
Now, at the federal level and among private insurers, a new broad strategy to increase the value of medicine is being embraced. This strategy can be summed up by the phrase, volume to value. No longer will payers simply compensate providers for the volume of activity. Instead, payments will be made when high-value activity is demonstrated. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, is the organization that administers Medicare and Medicaid. When these programs are considered together, CMS is the largest single payer for health care in the U.S. CMS sums up the strategy to increase value by saying the goal is to shape the way health care is delivered to patients and to improve the quality of care system-wide, while helping to reduce the growth of health care costs. CMS added this further clarification. We want to reward value and care coordination rather than volume and care duplication. CMS believes in partnership with the private sector. The Department of Health and Human Services is testing and expanding new health care payment models, some focused on Medicare only, others in partnership with state Medicaid programs and or private payers to find models that can improve health care quality and reduce cost. That's the broad strategy. At the highest level with value-based payment, the payer rewards desirable activities instead of simply paying for all activities, such as exams, procedures, and tests, no matter how or why they are performed. There are many different models for rewarding desirable activities, however, at the most basic level, they all share the following characteristics. The healthcare provider enters into a contract with the payer. The contract specifies that the health care provider will be measured on a specific set of quality or performance measures. Then the provider reports or is measured by the payer on actual performance against the contractually agreed upon measures. Based on whether the provider achieves those measures, she either receives an additional payment as an incentive or reward, or if she fails to meet the contracted measures, she receives less payment, a penalty. The following are examples of what may be measured in the value-based payment model. Performance is a measure that applies to the provider following a certain protocol. For instance, a provider may receive an incentive payment or avoid a penalty by demonstrating that he implemented and is using a certified electronic health record, or EHR, in a specific way. Quality measures require the provider to demonstrate that a certain percentage of patients received quality of care based on established standards. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or AHRQ, the federal government's leading agency charged with improving the quality, safety, efficiency, and effectiveness of healthcare for all Americans, defines quality healthcare as doing the right thing for the right patient at the right time in the right way to achieve the best possible results. Quality measures can be divided into different categories. A process-based measure involves a physician performing a certain procedure. For example, she asks the patient about his smoking status and then records it. Outcome-based quality measures focus on whether the health of patients improves or deteriorates. An example of an outcome-based measure is the requirement that 95% of diabetic patients have their blood pressure under control. That is, the provider has to demonstrate that his patients are meeting the measure by having blood pressure readings within the defined good range. Consumer satisfaction with the care provided is another measure. Cost measures are concerned with whether the cost of the provider's services are within a certain range as determined by the contract. CMS has developed a taxonomy to categorize different types of healthcare payment models. This taxonomy shows four categories of payment methods. These categories increase in both complexity and the amount of money at risk for the provider from left to right. In the more basic categories 1 and 2, payments are still made on a fee-for-service schedule, but payments or penalties increase depending on the quality of the care provided. In the more complex categories, 3 and 4, the value-based payments are referred to as alternative payment models. It is within these two categories where the concept of shared risk comes into play, meaning that the provider agrees to keep a certain number of people well, and if they don't, they are paid less. If they do, they are paid more. This lecture focuses on categories 1 and 2. Medicare is rapidly adopting value-based payment models.
In 2011, almost no providers were paid based on value-based models. However, in 2016, 85 percent of providers who bill Medicare will receive at least some percentage of their payments from a value-based payment model. Of that 85 percent, the great majority of those are paid under Categories 1 and 2. A smaller number are being paid based on the more complex models represented by Categories 3 and 4. The CMS projects that by 2018, 50 percent of payments for Medicare will fall within the more complex payment models, which are very different from fee-for-service. Additionally, CMS predicts that 90 percent of all Medicare payments will be made under some kind of value-based model or arrangement. In addition to CMS, private insurance companies are also adopting this method of payment because their members want value, too. Through January 2015, 132 different payers, including some of the very large ones, such as United Healthcare and Aetna, have at least some form of value-based payment. States that pay their share of Medicaid are actively involved in changing their payment models for state-funded programs, from fee-for-service to value-based care. This graph shows a substantial increase since 2011 in private and state payers, who are also adopting these methods. What this means is that an increasing number of people in the U.S. are being treated by physicians who are being paid based on one form or another of value-based care. Health IT plays an essential role in value-based care. The concept of value-based care is based on measurement and reporting. Providers enter into contracts that pay or penalize them based on health care outcomes. Measurement systems require that the measurements of these goals be accurate. To focus on a percentage of a quality measure requires having accurate numerators and denominators for calculating that percentage. If these numbers are not accurate, the system breaks down. In addition, improving quality or processes, or any of the elements against which providers are measured in value-based care, requires rapid feedback. Manual processes, which involve paper records, don't provide the robustness and accuracy required to run a national program that affects nearly a million physicians and close to 300 million people in the U.S. who get health care. Electronic systems help provide the framework for the underlying data and information required to support value-based models. The Medicare and Medicaid EHR incentive programs, often referred to as meaningful use, has had a remarkable effect. The number of physicians in hospitals who are using electronic health records has increased dramatically since 2009 and continues to increase as we move forward. As this graph shows, the number of physicians using EHRs increased from under 50% in 2009 to over 80% by 2014. The use of EHRs by physicians and hospitals provides the foundation for value-based care systems. By establishing a program that compels the use of certified technology, the ONC and the federal government have ensured that the majority of physicians in the U.S. have the software to capture the information and calculate the right measurements that underlie value-based payment programs. This table shows out that when looking at certification standards, an EHR requires specific capabilities. In addition, the capacity to exchange electronic information and to integrate such information, which is essential to being able to upload quality measures and to get information back from payers, is also required in certified electronic health records. There have been some pronouncements about the end of the Meaningful Use Program. However, while the Medical EHR Incentive Program and other current programs, including the Physician Quality Reporting System, or PQRS, will no longer exist as standalone programs, core elements of meaningful use will continue. The Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, or MACRA, establishes the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS, and alternative payment models will continue to require certified EHRs and other elements of meaningful use. As announced by the CMS Administrator Andy Slavitt in early 2016, the Meaningful Use Program, as it has existed, will now be effectively over and will now be replaced by something better. This concludes Lecture A of Volume to Value. There are many pressures in place to move the U.S. from a fee-for-service to value-based care payment system.
This lecture provided an introduction to these reasons and included a definition for value in the context of health care reform. Concerns about the value of health care and examination of who exactly is paying those costs was reviewed. The fee-for-service payment model has both benefits and drawbacks, the broad strategy being led by CMS in partnership with state and private payers to move to value-based payment systems requires a switch from paying for volume to paying for value. Health information technology plays a role as part of the necessary infrastructure to measure and report on the value piece of this strategy.